You're listening to the May 27th, 2016 edition of the Surfwatch Cyber Risk Roundup, the weekly podcast that's focused on how the world of cybercrime is impacting business. This podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Hello, I am Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor, here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer. On this podcast, every week we bring you the top cybercrime events, advisories, and legal actions from the past week, and jump right into the top cybercrime event this week. Now, since Jeff and I are from Wisconsin, in case you guys couldn't tell by our accents, uh, this is the first time, and maybe the only time, you ever even hear any news about uh, what we're about to talk about, because their team norm is normally pretty bad. But we're going to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. If anyone doesn't know, they're an NBA team. Not, not the greatest of teams. Uh, some of the players for the NBA, this NBA team, they had their W-2 information stolen after an employee for the Bucks fell for an email impersonating the team's president and forwarded the player's W-2 information to an unknown scammer. Now, we've heard a lot about this before. Um, very prominent this year in 2016. I, I think they're the first professional sports team that I've seen Could be. fall for this game. Yeah, I, I certainly haven't seen anyone else. And, and it would figure that would be the, you know, like the Bucks or something. <laughs> Go Wisconsin. <laughs> Go Wisconsin. The spoofed email came on April 26th. And on May 16th, the Bucks discovered the serious security incident. Uh, that's a direct quote. Uh, <laughs> the FBI, IRS, NBA, and the NBA Players Association were all notified. And here's a quote from, one, from an unknown players agent uh, about the breach. The communication received on this major security breach is unacceptable. The players need to know the exact measures being taken by the Bucks and the FBI to ensure each and every player's identity and financial information will not be compromised. There needs to be accountability for such a mistake, details on the steps taken to rectify it, and a process put in place to make sure this never happens again. End quote. Moving on, another uh, big story everyone's been talking about is the cyber espionage campaign against RUAG. They are a contractor that provides equipment and munitions for the Swiss military. So the reason this is in the news is Switzerland's computer emergency readiness team, uh, the Swiss CERT, they put out a report about this uh, two-year cyber espionage campaign. And according to the CERT report, the attack started as early as September 2014 when the first computers were affected. They didn't uh, elaborate on exactly what data was stolen, but they did elaborate a little bit on how this attack happened. Threat Post had a pretty good article up about the report. You could read the report directly as well if you go to a Swiss search website. This Threat Post article, they said that the attack started as early as September 2014, and central to the attack was the use of Epic Turla, which is a highly sophisticated and ongoing cyber espionage campaign that targets government, militaries, and embassies. This type of attack uses a mix of spear phishing and PDF-based exploits, social engineering to entice email recipients to run a malware-infected .scr extension, or a watering hole type attack leveraging Java exploit or a fake Flash player. And they, and they didn't say what exactly was taken, but according to the defense minister, uh, they did breach the company server and steal an undisclosed amount of data. And, you know, and here, you know, here's a good example of the Swiss military wasn't targeted directly. Again, this was a, this is a contractor, what we like to call like a third party vendor. And, and that's a very, that's a very common attack vector. It's, it's also very effective. We've seen this in a lot of, you know, like target, the, the, the store target comes to mind. Third party con uh, vendor was compromised and it led to target. And the consequences of that breach were massive. So. Now, when you're talking military government targets and that, and this is how they're being targeted, that that could have some serious implications. It's kind of scary if you think about it. You know, you really got to pay attention to who you're doing business with and what you know what they're doing to protect your data because they'll have access to it. Yeah, and they also mentioned that uh, sometimes they use these watering hole type attacks, and it seems like you see those a lot of times in these cyber espionage campaigns. There's always these watering hole attacks where they figure out where these different people congregate on the web or what websites they use and, and try to compromise those. Obviously, you see them in other attacks as well, but it seems like every time there's a cyber espionage campaign, there's a lot of times these watering hole things that pop up. Yeah. 
Coming in number three, we're going to talk about Walmart. Walmart's actually been making news quite a few times on this podcast. This time, uh, this is this is news that was actually broke by Brian Krebs. Uh, at various Walmart locations, credit card skimmers have been found in self-checkout lanes. Uh, the skimmers are created to be installed in seconds as they simply go over the top of the existing terminal. So what's being talked about here, so you go on the line and they have the, the little payment card terminal. You swipe your card and enter your PIN, whatever. What's happening here is there is a duplicate card skimmer that is created to go right over the top of the existing card reader that that's there. It takes people seconds to install it. It goes right over the top and it reads all the information that your card has on it. It's crazy. These skimmers were designed to work with card readers designed and distributed by the payment solutions company Ingenico. Um, here is a quote from Brian Krebs, and this is based off of a picture that he presented of these card skimmers. Uh, this Ingenico overlay skimmer has a pin pad overlay to capture the user's pin and a mechanism for recording the data stored on a card's magnetic stripe when customers swipe the cards at self-checkout aisles. The picture also shows a random wire uh, underneath of it. I know you guys can't see it. I'm just trying to describe it to you and probably not doing the best of jobs. <laughs> um, well, this wire that's pictured, uh, Brian Krebs goes on to describe what it's used for, and he says uh, the wire pictured at the bottom is for offloading the data from the card skimmers once thieves have retrieved the devices from compromised checkout lanes. This is something I have seen before. I saw a YouTube video that's funny. I was just going to ask you because yeah. I think we were sharing it back and forth with it our coworkers. It was crazy. The, so, and here's what happened. Jeff, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I can't remember the store that it happened at. I think it was like a convenience store, the one that we like were that. watching. The clerk, uh, the checkout clerk left for like five seconds. I think it was like a two-man team and the first guy yep. basically said, hey, give me a pack of smokes or something. And then he turned around and it was just, I mean, it had to be less than yeah. a second and a half. Just, he whipped just it reach out, over, put bam. it on, and it was done. And after that, every card that went through it was compromised. So it's a pretty impressive attack. And again, it, the the word that keeps coming to mind when I think it's scary. I mean, that's think about that. Uh, it took it's like two seconds. Boom, boom. It's like uh, connecting Legos. It's gets crazy. And then moving on, we have a breach at the furry site Fur Affinity. This website recently reported several incidents, including stolen source code, email addresses, and hashed passwords, as well as the deletion of user content. Now, this story is pretty interesting because we always talk about the different advisories on the podcast, and um, sometimes, you know, for the, especially the non-technical people, that can get kind of boring, just all the different vulnerabilities and exploits and things that are out there that, are, that people are warning about. Well, a few weeks ago, everyone was talking about this image tragic exploit in the image magic library. And this attack here is actually tied to that because this is a quote from an admin who posted this on the site's forum. This admin wrote, it was brought to our attention last night, this was on May 16th, that someone had obtained a copy of Fur Affinity's source code via the recent image tragic exploit in the image magic library. The exploit was patched earlier this month, but not before a malicious user was able to download a copy of our source code and later actively distributed it via USB drives at a convention. So even though they knew about the vulnerability and they took action to patch it, they didn't do it quick enough and the thieves were quicker than they were patching it and they ended up uh, having some of this uh, happen. And then after that happened, there was a second attack. And the second attack targeted the site's database by deleting user content, uh, user information and submissions and things like that. So the site ended up getting restored to a May 11th backup, but approximately six days worth of user-created content ended up being lost because because of this attack. So just kind of interesting that we talked about this, this advisor just a couple weeks ago, and now here we are seeing it in the wild where people are actually uh, getting attacked with it. And coming in at number five, this isn't really, um, I think this is important to talk about. It's not really, I wouldn't say uh, this company was targeted, but uh, I think it's important to bring up what happened here. We're going to talk about the online marketplace Fiverr. And according, this is uh, according to a blog post from Imperva, a DDoS for hire service was found on the Fiverr website. The ads for the service are found all over the site. 
Research is from Imperva. They did reach out to Fiverr to inform them that this DDoS for hire ads were dis- being displayed, and they were eventually taken down. Sounds like it's really not that big a deal. You know, some people just kind of post it. They they weren't attacked. Uh, Fiverr, their website wasn't. It wasn't like they were being used for malvertising or something. But I think this is important to bring up that if you're not paying attention to, you know, what like people are posting on your site or like, you know, what people are advertising or saying that can have a lot of negative, that can have some brand damage, you know, uh, Fiverr, if they didn't address this issue, you know, what does that say about them? If they're allowing these people to market this DDoS for hire service on their website, um, it can lead to potentially bad press uh, for the company. Yeah. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, I recently put up a blog on, uh, Surfwatch Labs blog. It's our weekly shout out. Go to blog.surfwatchlabs.com. Right. Got the plugin. But I recently put up a blog post about we've been looking at some of the top dark web markets and we wrote something about Alpha Bay and we've wrote a few different blogs just talking about how the dark web is really it's pretty easily accessible and it's easy to buy this stuff on here. So I think this is interesting just to point out that even on common sites that a lot of people know about on use such as Fiverr you can also find some of these DDoS for hire services and a lot of people advertising their their malicious stuff on there as well. So a lot of times people just assume everything's on this hidden underground dark web where all these criminals congregate. But a lot of the stuff's right out in the open on, you know, they use sites like Fiverr or other websites to, to advertise and, and get their stuff out there as well. Moving on to the uh, top five advisors for the week, we're going to start off with a new malware that is being called Furtum Malware. And I'll get into why it's called Furtum in just a second. This is a new malware. It's being described as a stealthy malware, malware, and it attempts to steal credentials while avoiding detection on a user's PC. The malware, again, is dubbed Furtum, which means by stealth in Latin. So, ooh, that's pretty... Uh, anytime you add Latin to something, I think that gives it a little extra Impressive, flair and yeah. pop. pop. Uh, the malware consists of a driver, a downloader, and three payloads. Uh, the three payloads consist of a power-saving tool that ensures communication is taking place between the infected PC and Furtum's uh, command and control server, a credential stealer named Pony Stealer, which I... Which we've seen quite a bit in different yes. malwares. Pony Stealer is yep. pretty popular. And another unnamed file that communicates back to the server. So put all these three together, and that's kind of how this Furtum malware uh, works. Now, what separates Furtum from other malwares, again, is its stealth capabilities. The malware creators designed the malware to go to great lengths to remain hidden as it checks for over 400 security tools on an infected PC before it operates, which is pretty extensive. It also blocks access to about 250 security-related sites and avoids DNS filtering services by replacing any known filtering name server to public name servers. There's still a lot of unknowns about this malware. It's very new. What is known about it is that it does appear to have ties to a Russian domain, uh, as this is where the command and control server is hosted. And the communications are also configured to accept Russian. Uh, That's really all that's known about it. And the reason that this is uh, relevant while we're talking about it, it hasn't really been observed doing a whole lot yet. A lot of these malwares, more is being done to make sure that it's not detected on a PC, which gives it more time to do its intended... uh, Well, yeah, just if you go back to the cyber espionage campaign we were talking about with Swiss Cert, they said it was September 2014 when computers were first infected, and it didn't get public till just uh, May 2016. Right. So uh, moving on, we're going to talk about a blog post from Malware Bytes. They put out a blog about the DMA Locker ransomware, and the headline was kind of catchy. It said uh, basically that this this product is being prepared to be distributed on a massive scale. So they've been watching this uh, DMA Locker ransomware over the year, and recently DMA Locker 4.0 came out, and they added some new features in there. One of the newest features of the ransomware is that it now uses a command and control server. So obviously the device needs to be connected to the internet for it to function, whereas previously uh, it didn't have that connection. And I think previously it wasn't nearly as sophisticated of a ransomware, uh, not to say that I think malware bytes, they really didn't describe it as sophisticated. They said it's basically kind of run of the mill, but they're implementing a lot of these changes. They said that the reason they think it's preparing to be distributed on a massive scale is that 
uh, a few different important things got automated. Distribution is now exploit based, and that makes it reach much more targets. Purchasing a key and managing payment is supported via a dedicated panel, so it no longer requires human interaction to make these payments. So it seems like they're beefing this up with 4.0, and uh, according to Malwarebytes, at least, they're saying that watch out, that they're going to start distributing it on a massive scale. That's their words. Coming coming at number three, we have another, we have more ransomware news. This time we're going to talk about the Cerber ransomware. A Russian underground forum was spotted selling a new variant of the Cerber ransomware. Uh, this version of the Cerber ransomware uses Windows script files as a new attack vector. Um, Windows script files, or WSFs, are executable with the Windows WScript.exe utility and can contain scripts from any Windows script compatible scripting engine in a single file. After successful ex- execution of the file, the server crypto ransomware will be downloaded on the victim system. Uh, so what we got here is just, uh, again, it, it's these ransomwares, these malwares. They're coming up with new new attack vectors, new ways uh, of infecting systems, and, and just constantly new ways of doing anything, really. Another advisor that came out is a researcher published a proof-of-concept attack about pace jacking. Uh, pace jacking isn't anything new. Pace jacking is basically where developers use CSS to append malicious content to the clipboard without a user noticing and thus fool them into executing unwanted commands. So security researcher Dylan Avery, he recently published a new version of this attack that uses JavaScript for the attack vector, not CSS. And this makes the old clipboard hijacking attack much more relevant as using JavaScript makes the attack harder to spot and harder to stop. And this is what Dylan Avery said. He said the attack can be deadly if combined with tech support pages or phishing emails. Users might think they're copying innocent text into their console, but in fact, they're running the crook's exploit for them. Yeah, so it, it just sounds like a, a interesting kind of attack vector that people should be watching out for. Uh, and this is just a, a proof of concept that people have been talking about this week. There's a few different articles out there about it. Yeah, and coming in at number five, we're going to talk about WhatsApp again. That's again, again, that's another application we've talked about in the past. WhatsApp users are being tricked in a new scam that is offering a new version of WhatsApp called WhatsApp Gold. Unfortunately, this is not a real version of WhatsApp, and users who download the app are are instead infected with malware on their mobile device. The feature promises users new abilities, such as video chatting and the ability to send 100 pictures at once. Man, sign me up. That sounds great. Uh, The (laughs) The malware used to infect devices is unknown. But it could allow cyber criminals to steal information from the device. So, Those were the top advisories that a lot of people were talking about this week. Moving on to some of the legal settlements, lawsuits, and other legal news that was trending this week. There was an interesting news story regarding sharing data between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, if you remember, we've talked about the safe harbor arrangement on this podcast before. And the Europe, Europe's high court overturned the safe harbor arrangement. So Safe Harbor basically allowed U.S. companies or, you know, to share data back and forth between the U.S. and the EU. And previously, this, the Europe's High Court basically said that's illegal, that you're, that the Safe Harbor Agreement isn't adequately protecting Europeans' privacy rights because there's higher standard of privacy over in Europe. So Max Schrems, uh, he's a, he's an Australian lawyer and he brought this, this case forward. The same guy is now basically bringing a new case that's related. And this week, the Irish privacy watchdog has said that it would bring concerns around Facebook's current data transfer mechanisms to the same uh, high court. And since Safe Harbor was overturned, companies have now shifted to relying on legal arrangements known as model contracts to transfer this data. And so this case is challenging whether those model contract arrangements abide with these more strict European laws. So in effect, the concern is that people from the European Union, their citizens, will not have an effective legal remedy in the events that, that their rights were trampled on by a U.S. public authority. Cough, cough, NSA is the concern. 
So basically, as you know, the potential ramifications is if this all hits the fan, then you would have to actually physically house your data in Europe, and you wouldn't be able to transfer back and forth. What a mess! That yeah. just sounds. Well, yeah, Facebook. Uh, one of the spokespeople for Facebook, they said. The question the Irish Data Protection Commissioner plans to raise with the court regarding standard contract clauses will be relevant to many companies operating in Europe. And Max Schrems, he kind of brought this whole thing to the front here. He basically is saying, well, if the European High Court killed Safe Harbor based on the existence of these U.S. surveillance laws, then they should do the same thing with these model contracts because uh, his argument is kind of doing the same thing. They are trying to work on this U.S. Privacy Shield, which is the replacement for Safe Harbor. And articles I read said that that could be completed by the end of June. But I saw just today, um, there was some press release I saw basically from uh, the European government talking about, quote, deficiencies in that framework as well. So there's people concerned about whether this new framework is still going to not satisfy the privacy laws. So. You know, if you're one of those businesses that are transferring data, um, I'm sure you're aware of this and keeping an eye on. Yeah, no happens. kidding, because of the the incoming headache that's about to happen if all that goes through. Uh, coming in at number two, uh, legal advisors for the week, we're going to talk about Wells Fargo. A FINRA arbitration panel ruled that a Wells Fargo advisor and the company's brokerage arm must pay $1.1 million in order to resolve a dispute over the theft of client information from UBS. David Kinnear resigned from UBS in 2012, and UBS claimed Kinnear stole proprietary information and confidential data on thousands of his clients before leaving, according to the copy of the award seen by On Wall Street. Kinnear then allegedly used that information to move his former client's business to Wells Fargo as well as to solicit other UBS clients. UBS allegedly retaliated by making false and malicious statements about Kinnear, both sides were held liable by the panel, Kinnear and Wells Fargo, for $1.5 million in compensatory damages to UBS, and UBS for $400,000 in damages to Wells Fargo, which comes out to the $1.1 million. Just another one of the many insider, employee insider theft kind of cases that we see each week. Yep. Uh, moving on, it seems like every week we have stuff on W-2 theft, and this is our Update to go along with the Milwaukee Bucks story. Rockhurst University in Missouri is facing a potential class action lawsuit over the theft of W-2 information. On April 4th, they fell for the classic W-2 phishing scam everyone's talking about, where someone impersonated a university ad administrator, requested the W-2 information, an employee fell for that scam, and all employees who worked at the university in 2015 were impacted by this breach, and that was between 12 and 1,300 people. So this lawsuit is arguing basically the standard stuff. The university harmed the employees by failing to establish and implement appropriate administrative safeguards to protect their information, that they're now open to identity theft and other potential harm, and yada, yada, yada. It is interesting, all this employee stuff, because a lot of times, you know, especially like small businesses and stuff that maybe doesn't have a lot of customer data, you might think, well, man, I don't really have any customer data. I don't have to worry about, you know, theft of any data. But even if you're a small business, you probably have information on a couple employees. You probably have social security numbers, things like that, W-2 data. So, you know, it's just something I think a lot of people kind of overlook, especially if you're typically one of those people that don't house all this data. You're not a large company. Uh, right. It's easy to overlook the fact that, hey, you probably have employees, and where is that employee's information sitting? Right. Every company has something that of value from a cyber criminal, that's for sure. Coming up before, we're going to talk about an ATM skimming operation that was dismantled. Law enforcement has disrupted an international criminal group responsible for a large-scale ATM skimming and money laundering operation that led to losses for more than a half million euros. The group was comprised of mainly French-Italian nationals and harvested financial data from ATMs in different areas of France in order to create fake cards and withdraw large sums of money from ATMs in Asia and the U.S. And there was, this was from Europol, they put out a press release, and I think it was just last week or a couple weeks ago, there was another ATM scheming operation that was dismantled as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and just to throw in, I saw a bit of other ATM news this week. Um, I don't know if you saw, Matt, the uh, the huge ATM theft in Japan. 
twelve point seven million dollars was I stolen. I believe in just like an hour or so. Yep. And then also Kaspersky Lab, they put out a warning this week about this uh, skimmer malware, which turns the whole ATM into a skimmer. Basically, it's malware as opposed to like an actual physical skimmer. And a lot of people think skimming is kind of the old school method, and uh, but obviously it's still happening. Quite still a bit. tried and true, and seems to work pretty well. Uh, and then to wrap up, we just have a couple of uh, interesting arrests that happened this week. I'll just run through real quick. Uh, everyone remembers Celebgate, the, uh, all the, the nude celebrity photos and stuff that happened. Uh, well, one of the guys at least tied to this, Ryan Collins, 36, of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, he pled guilty to gaining access to over 100 different Apple and Google accounts by stealing credentials. He would send phishing messages, and then people would hand over their username and password. Uh, and then he was able to uh, then get in those accounts and got these nude photographs and videos. Doesn't say when he's going to be sentenced. There was a, a carding website op- operator that's been extradited to the U.S. We always talk about these dark web forums and different forums are sometimes not on the dark web where people sell this stolen payment card information. Uh, this guy is from Macedonia and he ran Code Shop and he's been ex- extradited and charged with running this website. That led to data for more, so running this website that led to data for more than 181,000 different cards being purchased, and that resulted in millions of dollars in financial losses. So he sounds like he's in trouble, assuming he's guilty. Obviously innocent till proven guilty. Uh, and then finally, we talk a lot of times about all the stolen W-2 information. There was a few different arrests related to uh, the IRS and tax fraud. The Treasury Department arrested five people in Miami accused of posing as IRS agents and demanding people make payment on their overdue taxes. And then there was also an Oregon woman. She pled guilty to $1.2 million in federal income tax fraud involving 224 false returns. Sounded like she had a pretty good system because she was using different banks and stuff to deposit it, but then apparently she deposited twenty five grand into her own account. So. Oh, that's never good. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, you're killing it. Killing uh, a good thing. Uh, so those are some of the arrests. There was obviously a lot more. Criminals always getting arrested for doing stupid things. So yeah, that wraps up the top trending events, advisories, and legal actions. Now we'll move on to the funny story of the week to wrap up the podcast. Story we're going to talk about this week. Uh, here was the headline: Man hacks highway sign to read "Drive Crazy, Y'all." Here's the guy behind what happened here. Jeffrey Eltgroth, he's uh, 26 of Leander, Texas. He was walking his dog along a road uh, about 25 miles north of North Austin this last Sunday. He was ultimately arrested for changing this road sign to read, Drive Crazy, Y'all. According to the affidavit, uh, Eltgroth admitted to the attack, and here's what he said. He admitted to typing in a username and password, which he guessed for the sign and to deleting the messages to warn traffic of upcoming construction and typing the different message because he believed it was humorous. Maybe not completely funny, but I thought it was funny when I read it. On Sunday, Altgroff was charged with criminal mischief and tampering with transportation communication equipment. This is a third degree felony, punishable by up to 10 years in prison, uh, though the maximum sentence uh, the maximum sentence for something like this is rarely passed. Al Groth is currently in jail for this crime. Uh, I, yeah, personally, I always find these things funny. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's wrong of me, but <laughs> drive, drive crazy, y'all. There's probably a a bridge out or something, but just go nuts. That'll wrap up this week's Surfwatch Cyber Risk Roundup. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs helps organizations and service providers quickly establish a strategic cyber threat intelligence operation that drives more effective use of their tactical defenses. For interviews with cyber experts, check out Surfwatch Labs' other podcast, The Cyber Chat. And to learn more about cyber threat intelligence, go to Surfwatch Labs' website, surfwatchlab.com.